at the time in the 1950s, Hillsdale was just really starting to establish itself uh, on the national level uh, as a small college power. Hillsdale had won, at the time, 16 straight games, and that winning streak was really starting to get noticed, at least around Michigan. In the fall of 1955, the Hillsdale College football team was on top of the world with coach Frank Muddy Waters at the helm. The Dells were unstoppable. Posting a 9-0 record, they were well on their way to an invitation to the New Year's Day Bowl. Well, um, I know we had a really good season. I'd have to look to see what our, what our record totally was. It's probably 9-0 because we had reached a point where we were not losing games, and we just uh, we were really a good team. Uh, each year, we just got better and better. Uh, the players we got, we we uh, the coaches brought in. We had some good coaches. Muddy Waters, who was the head coach, did a heck of a job, you know, recruiting and bringing people in, and then uh, making everybody feel comfortable and uh, just make, developing a good football team. The deal was all but done for Hillsdale to round out their perfect season with an appearance in the Tangerine Bowl, but there was one condition. This is a story of a football team who gave up their success on the field to preserve the dignity of their brothers off the field. This is a story of a group of young men who placed love for their teammates above the opportunity of a lifetime. This is a story of the 1955 Hillsdale College football team that chose a better kind of glory. Just southwest of Ann Arbor, Michigan sits a small liberal arts school that was the first college in the state to equally admit all people, regardless of color, gender, or creed. Founded in 1844, Hillsdale College's founding constitution reads, the object of this institution is and shall be to furnish to all persons who wish, irrespective of nationality, color, or sex, a literary, scientific, or theological education. Those words are just as true today as they were at the institution's inception. And in 1953, when four young men were recruited to play football for the Hillsdale College Dales. Uh, Muddy said, um, well, I'm from Hillsdale, and how would you like to play football for Hillsdale College? <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> I think I think that uh, when I look back at at, uh, at my experience at Hillsdale, I think it, it really uh, was a part of in football in, in in general sports. You know, it helps to build character actually, and it helps to develop uh, I'd say friendship and, and toughness and just a lot of good character. Andy Kincannon, Nate Clark. Lee Jones, Clint Griffin, all played for Frank Muddy Waters from 1954 to 1957. In keeping with Hillsdale's tradition, Muddy wasn't concerned with the color of his player's skin, but with the content of their character, both on and off the field. He could bring in all kinds of different people uh, to be part of the team. And the acceptance that members of the team learned for each other. Well, I think uh, 
I think the idea of being uh, brothers uh, was would be fairly accurate. I mean, we uh, we thought of them as good friends at the time, and and the true meaning of a teammate, I think. In 1955, Muddy was in his early years as head coach of the Dales. Though a young and arguably inexperienced coach, Muddy's players loved him, and he loved them. He strove to cultivate a culture of brotherhood and sportsmanship in his locker room. A line that he got from his, one of his coaches was, the difference between good and great is a little extra effort. And so, I mean, I think his, his philosophy was, doing everything that you can every every day to um, to be the best that you can and that was kind of his philosophy and he also was understanding and he gave folks second chances um, people that that maybe uh, you know other folks had written off um, he gave an opportunity to and that was his philosophy is is give folks an opportunity uh, an honest opportunity and and um, work towards a, a common goal I think Muddy Muddy was a was down to earth was a down to earth guy. He was the coach. Yeah. Basically, I would have to say Muddy was a great guy. I mean, he would, uh, he, you know, you knew that he was on your side. He was fair, uh, and he was, you know, very knowledgeable coach too. Muddy would go on to a successful career in football but the 1955 season would be one of his defining moments. The 1955 Dales posted an undefeatable season. Game after game, they destroyed their competition, ultimately advancing to a 9-0 record. The star of the team, Nate Clark, a Benton Harbor native, and a Hillsdale hero. They had Nate Clark, who was the, the national scoring leader for all divisions in, uh, in football, whether that be the NCAA in your big schools or all the way down to Hillsdale in your really small schools. He was a halfback. I was a fullback in a spinning fullback offense. So yeah, we were right next to each other for four years. But this guy right here was a—he was one heck of a running back. Oh my goodness! He, like I say, about five eleven, about two oh five, and he would run over people. Oh man, he—he <laughs> uh, he was a funny guy, uh, and uh, great guy. He's from Benton Harbor, and I mean, we just laughed. We laughed and talked all the time. We—we we were. He was one of my roommates. He's a, he was a great guy, but he's just a heck of an athlete, too. You know, I mean, he was, he was about 205, I say about uh, 510 or something, and fast, and I mean, he was, he was aggressive. I mean, when it came, you, you watch those games, and he would run over people. I mean, you could see that, him running over people, but uh, we just, because of that situation and the lack of a social life, we became really close, a lot closer, you know, because we ended up doing a lot more things together. For real evidence of Clark's talent, look no further than the Hillsdale on-campus restaurant. The restaurant gave away a free steak dinner to the scoring player. Clark broke the school's touchdown record in the 55 season, earning himself 24 steak dinners. 24 dinners for 24 touchdowns. He saved 11 of them to take his football buddies out to dinner. Um, one thing that's really interesting to, to read is Nate Clark's hometown paper uh, of Benton Harbor and how excited the people of Benton Harbor were. There are a lot of Hillsdale College football fans in 1955 from Benton Harbor just because Nate Clark was, was playing playing on the team and um, you know to to those people it was you know it was a team you know the, the concept of the team came above separating that there wasn't it wasn't an issue and we were very glad to have them on our team I mean Nate Clark was a good football player and we were we were glad to have him
and he was exceptional. And the, and the other other black guys that played, uh, I don't remember any any kind of uh, controversy or decision was to whether we liked it or didn't like it. It was just accepted, I think. Led by Clark, the Dells began to garner national attention for their performance. As the team continued its on-field domination, rumors of a bid to the New Year's Day Bowl began to spread. As the Tangerine Bowl and New Year's Day Bowls got closer, a lot of excitement was really generated around the state as people started to follow Hillsdale. And so that 1955 season is really what, what Muddy Waters as a head coach and Hillsdale as a small college power on the map. So the Tangerine Bowl is pretty significant still today in 2021. It's a New Year's Day Bowl. It's called the Florida Citrus Bowl, but essentially it dates all the way back into the 1950s. And in the 1950s, the Tangerine Bowl was also nationally a big deal, but it really focused on the best small college teams. So while your Rose Bowl was putting the, the Pac-10 or Pac-12 today or whatever it was then in the Big Ten together, the Tangerine Bowl was looking for two of the top small college teams to showcase. Historically, the Tangerine Bowl held in Orlando, Florida was a whites only bowl game. No mixed race team had ever played in it. But Muddy spent the season lobbying the bowl for a bid and arguing for all his players to have the right to play. Muddy Waters went down to Orlando and he spent an entire week uh, prior to um, that selection being made. Um, but he took with him letters from four governors um, and six U.S. senators, and one of the trustees went with him. And so um, there was huge excitement building up to this, even, even weeks before the season ended. Uh, there's a story I read about how that last win of the regular season over Lewis College, 3,000 people stormed the field in anticipation that Hillsdale would be going to the Tangerine Bowl. Um, the Tangerine Bowl had announced that Hillsdale was a candidate weeks before and had asked for alumni to submit like letters of backing. And they were just overwhelmed with all the support that Hillsdale received um, from alumni. So this was some, it wasn't just a, a news flash that, you know, Hillsdale was invited and they were turned down. There was massive uh, anticipation across the state that this was going to be a done deal. After much negotiation, Muddy thought he came back to Michigan successful. He had convinced the committee to allow all players to play if selected, but he wasn't too hopeful about Hillsdale's chances at an invitation. He told a local newspaper at the time, it took a tremendous selling job to get the cause out. When we succeeded, we naturally thought that our chances were great but when it came to a vote, only two of the seven members on the committee voted for us. Muddy had good reason to be nervous, as he had to convince more than just the Tangerine Bowl committee members to let him play. The, the work that Muddy Waters did and some trustees from the college did wasn't so much to lobby the members of the selection committee, although that was obviously part of it. Um, they were actually working with the city of Orlando and it was the city of Orlando had ordinances in place and so a lot of what was driving that um, you know that request that African-American players not play had to do also with the city the civic level not just with the bowl organizers and um, an article I read uh, I believe it was in the Battle Creek Inquirer said that you know one of muddy's proudest moments and something that he didn't think would happen would be the fact that they were able to get the city of orlando to adjust that or suspend that in the event that hillsdale was selected for the game the committee officially invited 
the Hillsdale College football team to the 1956 Tangerine Bowl, the first bowl bid in school history. But the committee went back on their word, demanding that the Dales play without their four African-American players. He came in and talked to us and he said, this is what is happening, okay? And uh, they don't want us to play because uh, they don't want, want, want their team to play against black guys. I remember that we thought we had an invitation and then um, it never came to, to be. Faced with a tough decision, Coach Muddy Waters decided to let his players have the final say. I think it stems from, uh, from the coaches too, you know, because our coach Muddy came in and, and talked to us about that. And he said, if you guys decide you don't want to play, uh, you know, I can understand. And so uh, we kind of looked at each other and you could hear in the background different guys saying, you know, no, we won't play, we won't play. And I think we had a meeting and it was just decided that if, if, if we all could not play, uh, then nobody would play. You know, we wouldn't go to the bowl game. And so that's, and then Muddy decided, Muddy, Muddy you know, felt like that too. And so that was what the, what what happened. As I understand it, uh, my grandfather wanted it to be a team decision, um, and so he felt very comfortable that they'd come to the right decision, and uh, the the team put it to a vote, and uh, they elected not to go, which I, I, he was very proud of. Um, I think one of his proudest moments in coaching. And, he, and you know, not everybody was uh, was you know speaking up, but. Uh, it was obvious that uh, we had developed a camaraderie, which is what you get when you have when you're on a team, regardless of what it is, and 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 you're if you're successful. I think when you have success, you you tend to be get closer, you know, to each other, and so as a result, you know, you become like brothers, and so. Um, they got, you know, we, we, we talked about it and, and I think everybody just said, no, you know, we, we, we don't want to go. We're not going to go. If, if, if we can, they're not going to allow everybody to play. No, we don't want to go. How did that make you feel? Great. It's like, wow. I mean, that really says something. It says something that, you know, you guys would turn down a bowl game because they felt more strongly about you. Had he thought it was going to go any other way, I don't know that he would have um, done it that way. Um, but I think he was confident in, in the people that they were and the program that they had and the fact that they were teammates. Um, and that means something that, that there wasn't really any alternative to, to what it would be and it was as i understand it, it was tough on the seniors because they were done you know i mean it's uh when you you put all your energy in, into a sport um and you're really good and you had this opportunity and you didn't back then the, the bowl games were few and far between so to have that kind of opportunity um says a lot about the players uh as well as my grandfather that you know that was it. Their season was over. They were never going to play football again. So, um, but he was confident that they were all men of character and, and would do the right thing. When you think about it um, in terms of, of that moment, um, it was it was an act of heroism, obviously, but it was just people doing what they felt was right at the time that way. You know, it wasn't to to create some grandstanding moment, um, but it just it was just leadership by example. Like, no, we're not going to be a part of this if not every member of the team gets to gets to participate. Without these players, we're not us as a team. That's that's not the teamwork, and so um, I think it speaks to the level of sacrifice that Muddy Waters always always preach to his players and that it's always been a part of Hillsdale College football there that yes we may have this opportunity but we're not going to take part in that 
unless we can all come. And so, yes, we're going to give up possibly playing on January 2nd in front of national notoriety. Um, but we're more focused on ourselves as the team, and we're going to keep our, our program moving forward there. I would say it's more of a um, knowing what's right and wrong and doing what's right, um, not just in the context of racial relations uh, or racial issues, but, um, you know, in our family, and it comes from my grandfather and, and my grandmother and, and, and you know, I think taught through generations is that, um, you know, in most situations, there's a there's a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. And it, it usually isn't gray. Um, sometimes it is, but but a lot of times it's not. And, and when it's not, you got to do the right thing. So, yeah, I, I think um, that was important to him. Um, and it was part of a bigger picture of, of you got to do it right. And it's uh, it's just it was important to him, you know, to, to treat people equally. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, they're they were teammates. They were part of the team, and it's not something that it wasn't right. So they 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 didn't go. At the time, the 1955 Dales knew why they were absent from the Tangerine Bowl. But the rest of the country did. The Tangerine Bow Committee made an official statement claiming that Hillsdale was not invited because they were too strong to play against other small colleges. The way that the Tangerine Bowl spun Hillsdale not being a part of it after so much anticipation, after so much support, was that they declared that Hillsdale would be too tough of an opponent for the other schools that they had available. So, and if you go back into those newspaper articles from Benton Harbor about Nate Clark and this whole process, um, they really uh, needle the Tangerine Bowl about, would have been great to see Hillsdale, but obviously they were too tough and Nate Clark was too tough to be part of it. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's another kind of angle of how this committee tried to save face. Um, I also know that it was organized by the Elks Club. And so there was a big backlash amongst Elks members nationally about the way that this all went down and then um, with the segregation and, and everything. So again, whatever role Hillsdale may have played nationally it it had ripple effects that went out there because of this decision at the time for the dales the decision was bigger than football it was a better kind of glory they could have said it you know because they said no we want to play but uh, they just felt that they would they would prefer you know if if, if they were going to leave the players at some of the players at home uh, it, it's, you know, it was more important to them to, uh, to bring everybody. I mean, that, that was, to me, it was like, uh, uh, it was a serious, uh, how would I want to put that, the word for that? It was, it was a serious, um, expectation that this team would say, we're going to play, we will play you, but you have, you have to leave the black guys at home. I mean, this was a part of the team, you know, and, uh, and an important part of the team, period. It was, really. Well, because it was it was so much bigger than than football. Um, you know, I, I, he has a way, uh, or he had a way of connecting with players. Um, and I know it from the... the the, folk, the, the players that come up to me, I mean, you know, he's passed away, he hasn't coached in decades. But um, if I'm somewhere and, and someone finds out who I am and they were one of his players, uh, they come up to me and, and just tell me great things about uh, him and, and what a difference he made in, in their life. So I, I think it was his proudest moment because it wasn't just about football. Um, it was about bigger issues, and, and I, I think, yes, he taught football, but he also wanted to, to build young men, and that's, that's why it was the most possible. Right now, we're going to start, start, start. Oh. Oh.
It's been this 130 year lineage of, of players and and so there's there's this great brotherhood amongst somebody that wore the white and blue at Hillsdale College. You wore the same uniforms and you were you played on the same field. We speak very often about the tradition of Hillsdale College. I mean Hillsdale College has been around you know, for over 175 years, and we are currently coaching team 128. So there's a long, rich, deep tradition of football and and certainly the Tangerine Bowl and that experience uh, speaks to uh, the part of that tradition. Well, I think the whole aspect of what happened in 1955 was that you saw what this program values and it's not the color of your skin. Um, it's not where you came from, but it's more about the character of your heart. And if you're a part of the Char Charger football team, you know that you have um, good character. And I feel like that's the most important thing when we look at people is we're not judging them, of course, by the color of their skin, uh, but obviously uh, from the character that they have uh, inside of them. Not playing that game was perhaps one of the most influential things in terms of you know standing firm on that on that motto that Hillsdale was that, that Hillsdale College was founded on strength and choices in the challenge. Not playing that game just shows how true to those words they stuck to. While Hillsdale turned down the invitation to the 1956 Tangerine Bowl, the game was still played. The undefeated Juniata Indians faced the 8-1 and one Missouri State Vikings, but neither emerged victorious. The game ended in a 6-6 tie. Deck wide to the left, single wing back to the left. Engelhardt gets the ball, passes. It is caught by Ruth, a beautiful catch for the 25. Rudy goes to the 50. Rudy on the fair. Rudy Yeah, that is, for being such a nice guy, ultra, ultra competitive. Um, and and love winning, and, and you know, I think he, he really missed um, having that opportunity to play in that game and 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 prove that they were the best team. Um, but it meant more to to do it right and to to stand up against you know the racial injustice. Muddy Waters and the team they used that that success that they had uh, going into. Not being able to go to the bowl game didn't disrupt anything, and they went on to um, win 41 of their next 50 games and ultimately be determined by the other schools in the MIAA that Hillsdale was just too much of a power and um, essentially were shown the door of that conference because the other schools didn't feel it was competitive enough. Hillsdale would go on to win 18 more games uh, and they go into the 1957 Holiday Bowl in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, with the nation's longest winning streak at 34 games. And uh, interestingly enough, that record, those 34 wins, would stand all the way up into the last decade. Ron Perrion and Andy Kincannon graduated from Hillsdale in 1957. Both followed in the footsteps of their mentor, coaching high school football. Following a successful tenure at Hillsdale, Muddy took a coaching job with Saginaw Valley in the 1970s. Muddy came and, and, and said, Andy, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I got a job at Saginaw Valley. Did I say, no, yeah, Saginaw Valley College, would you like to come and work with me? Yeah, <laughs> why, why not? You know, that's, that's really what you're looking forward to is, you know, high school and then college and so forth. And so, yeah, then Muddy hired me there by him uh, saying, would you like to come and work with me? You know, that was like uh, another giant step, you know, for, for, for me from, from uh, let's say high school, uh, you know, to college. We were, we were pretty successful there. After Andy's time coaching as an assistant under Muddy, he got a job as a tight end coach at Indiana. Finally, Andy, got to go to a bowl game. We went to five bowl games. Um, and and uh, so we we really ended up 
uh, as a, as a, as one of the big, better, you know, football uh, teams in in the Big Ten at that time. What what happens is you go for each each bowl that you go to, you get a ring. I mean, this is really, you know, something nice to, to have is, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you look, it's something that you can look at and say, you know, okay, this is my bowl ring for such and such, because it's got all that information on it. I wear it, I just kind of change. I mean, I wear this one. I, I have, I've been wearing this one, for, I don't know. I just look at it and say, okay, I'm gonna wear this one. <laughs> I've been wearing this one for about a year, I think, yeah, yeah. While the Hillsdale College football team decided to forgo the opportunity of a lifetime, they made a decision that lives well beyond the game. History doesn't remember the winner of the 1956 Tangerine Bowl because there wasn't one, but it does remember the men of the 1955 Hillsdale College football team. Get better tomorrow. You know, obviously it was the right thing to do uh, but it would be a really hard thing. It would, it would test your character and your integrity um, at that point because it's such a special opportunity and um, they did the right thing. You know, we think of the, the 1956 Tangerine Bowl being an isolated event, but it was really a bigger part uh, of a movement toward more integration in sports that was happening. And, you know, when you think that Muddy Waters went all the way to the city government of the city of Orlando to work on this issue, it's it's bigger than Hillsdale just simply saying, no, we're not going to need to be part of, part of the game. It is something that we're proud of. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm very, very glad that, um, very sad that they were put in that situation, but very happy that they, they acted the way they did. Well, I think considering the circumstances today and then, I think it says a lot about the, the culture at the college at that time and, and probably still is. Okay, yeah, yeah, a great kind of glory, yeah. And that's what it was too. You know, you're talking about, you know, instead of going to play the, 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 the football, uh, instead, uh, you think there, there are things more important to that, you know, than that, and it's the, the you know, the relationships that you have, you know, with each other. Is that what it is? You tell me. <laughs> well, that's what it was. When I think about that, and I think about these players, and I see those players up there, you know, it's just something that you never forget, you know, which what you had going on, and what, what you... Uh, what went on during that time. If I had to do over, I'd do it over. <laughs> Try to do it a little bit better. <laughs>